hand over the podium to Dr. Uh, Rajkumar uh, to take over and talk about the intraoperative pitfalls in uh, total knee replacement. Now, last time we uh, um, talked about uh, uh, alignment in TKR, it was a very basic topic. Again, this time we want to cover the basics because this uh, whole um, meeting is meant for youngsters who are beginning or trying trying to start starting to do search, um, TKR surgery. And uh, I'm sure this will be of great use to all of you. At the end of the talk, we'll have a few case presentations and uh, discussions. I, I, um, I'm honored to uh, invite Dr. Bharat, uh, a renowned orthoplasty surgeon from uh, Chennai, um, my good friend and senior from college as well, who has joined uh, the panel. Um, sir, over to you, Dr. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um... Uh, Karthik for a very good introduction and I'm really uh, happy to be part of your uh, very good uh, initiative and academic uh, program and your series of uh, KS ortho care series. It's a good one and uh, that too, I think a lot of youngsters, not only youngsters, everybody will benefit out of this kind of discussions. I'm so happy and also the topics are very interesting. So let me uh, start the uh, topic. I've kept the um, my talk a little bit uh, very uh, practical and uh, uh, simple, simple in the sense I'm not going into too much of literature in this talk. In this talk, I'm just trying to share some practical tips and tricks. Uh, so that is my, uh, this talk. So I have compiled a uh, lot of points out of uh, um, practical uh, procedure as well. So let me start sharing my screen and uh, I would like to also thank Ortho TV for supporting your uh, initiative. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen, Karthik? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay, right. Can we start? Okay. Yes, sir. So, okay. intraoperative uh, pitfalls in primary TKR, it's prevention and management. Uh, this topic, more than uh, the management, our aim is to be prevented. It's the prevention it should be our aim. Uh, and not the management part because we don't want this intraoperative pitfalls. But sometimes it happens uh, even without our uh, uh, utmost care, it happens. So let us go through a few uh, of these uh, challenges what we face in our day-to-day -day practice in a totally replacement. Um, so intraoperative complications. So as we talk about the intraoperative complication, everybody will accept that it is the MCL injury which comes to our mind uh, immediately. Then comes the petalar tendon rupture, vascular injury, which is not very common. Um, but still, that also we have to keep it in mind. Periprosary, it's actually not a periprosary fracture. It is a perioperative fractures during the surgery. These are the most uh, immediate complications which come to our mind. But out of this, the MCL injury, petalar tendon injury, vascular injury, all are... Uh, uh, real challenging. It's a worst nightmare to really manage it. So the best idea is to prevent it. So medial collateral ligament, we all know that it is crucial and very important for stability and function. And whenever the MCL is injured in any ways, instability happens because of that wear and the uh, surgery fails. So we, our aim is to protect the MCL or the lateral collateral ligament. So the collateral ligaments are so important, particularly the medial collateral ligament. We have to be very careful. So the essential concept is we have to preserve the superficial medial collateral. This is the most important stabilizer on the medial side. So it has got two attachments, one proximally uh, into the proximal tibia and then one is the distal one, little distally and one femoral attachment. So we it has two tibial and one femoral. When doing the release, we have to be very careful. We should try to avoid as much as possible not to release, not to go into the stage of releasing it. But even if it happens, we have to be very careful. So intraoperative injuries to MCL, it is uncommon but serious complication. Nowadays, we have to be very careful and you need to know what exactly and where exactly the problem is happening. And uh, there are 2.7% uh, uh, literature support, um, uh, incidents has been reported. And uh, if you look at the intraoperative injuries, when it happens, the in, it happens particularly during extreme flexions and high force when you try to do a, give a varus or a valgus stress when doing a trial implant, particularly in a stiff knee. So 
the risk factors patient related are obesity stiff knee and severe varus with the medial tibial bone loss particularly in cases with the severe varus and ffd i always tell my fellows that these are this is the bad combination severe varus with the ffd and with the medial bone loss all three if it is there you have to be very careful you have to uh, be very protective on the medial side because of the lot of release it needs so if you see the types of mcl injury we need to know and uh, exactly where this problem happens so three places it happens one is the avulsion which is more of a patient related problem why this patient related i have put because of osteoporosis stiff knee all those things causes avulsion even though it is not fully patient related but the predominantly patient related which the surgeon has to be careful the next is the mid substance tear many a times or most of the time it is hydrogenic so it is surgeon related so these two are very very important that you need to understand whether it is an avulsion or a mid substance tear the late presentation of giving a of collaterals happens which i will come to it in a little uh, later in the talk so if you look at the mcl injury during a tkr it can happen in the mid substance transaction that is the mid substance tear which is hydrogenic femoral avulsion it happens on the femoral side whether it is in the epicondyle or in the osteophyte area i'll again explain in detail later then then if you see the tibial avulsion so tibial avulsion is not very common which happens when you when you are uh, releasing it too much down the distally that particularly the m Uh, superficial mcl so the most common here in this is the femoral avulsion so whenever you see an mcl injury you have to make sure whether it is an avulsion injury or a mid substance transaction that is the mcl gets cut so we need to know the more common the transaction is not that common but the mcl avulsion injury is very common which is the surgeon's factors or the patient factor surgeon factors is when you try to subluxate the tibia particularly during exposure when you want to bring down the tibia to the front end subluxate that is the time it happens it avulses because of the osteoporosis and also you trying to try to put the uh, insert your uh, trial insert with the tray when there is a tight flexion gap when you try to do that when the medial side is not allowing to open and you are trying to flex it and to force it uh, forcibly that times the avulsion happens then hyperflexion of the knee obese patient stiff knees you try to hyperflex that also happens yeah avulsion apples these times the failure to product the mcl while handling the these are all the surgeon factors patient factors which i already said it is the severe contracture associated uh, uh, severe deformities in the ffds and osteoporosis and obesity so mode of injury also is very important what is that the what the uh, diathermy or the knife related injury is when you do the uh, soft tissue release the capsular release or excision of the posterior half of the medial meniscus so when you try to release the uh, excise the medial meniscus that time there is a chance of your mcl getting injured the other half is a saw blade related which is when you are taking the femoral condyle resection or the proximal medial tibial resection so you have to be very clear whether it is a saw diathermy related or a blade related or a saw blade related so risk factors where all it happens where are all the problem happens let us see some examples osteoporosis see look at this case very osteoporotic stiff bone loss is there when you try to subluxate this is the pro, uh, case where very typically the avulsion injury happens stiff knee varus deformity with contracture rheumatoid arthritis very very common these kind of cases whenever you see an x ray like that you have to be very careful critical and keep in mind that you don't, don't try to force many things during the surgery and also obesity so very very important you keep it that very you have to be very very careful tell your assistants in these kind of cases you should prevent this avulsion injury so what all what all we steps we need to take so i always prefer these kind of three homens the moment i open the knee i use three homens to protect one lateral one medial two small homens and one little bigger homen till i take the proximal tibial cut and the uh, femoral cut till that time i use this bigger homens so once i do that then i what i do is i take another homens another small homens try to push the tibia forward like that trying to lever it out see if it is coming like this then i am safe that their avulsion chances are very less but if it is resisting 
then I will not try to subluxate. it. I will not subluxate it at all. I will do my cuts. And once I take the posterior femoral condyle cut, then I will try to pull the tibia out. So remember that when you try to force and try to subluxate the tibia, the avulsion injury happens. So I always use this third homan and try to subluxate. If it is resisting, stop it. So this is what I do. So after exposure, the next important thing what I do is I remove the osteophyte with the nibbler like that, the medial osteophyte. And you can see that there is a beaking osteophyte. See here, there is a beaking osteophyte after removing this. This osteophyte, the moment I see this, I put another small homan here, protect the MCL. Then after protecting, if you see, I use an osteotome, gently chip. You don't need to hammer it. Gently chip it because it is an osteophyte. It will automatically get dislodged from the femoral condyle. The moment this osteophyte comes out, then your MCL gets uh, lax because the kinking effect is gone. So this MCL gets lax. So in fact, you don't need to do any much release at all. Most of the time, you will not need a release. So this way, you are protecting the MCL and you are also preventing the avulsion injury. So the most of the uh, problem comes when you are trying to force the tibial tray, the trial uh, insert itself. That time what happens, the tibial tray goes and medially it goes and hits the osteophyte and then the osteophyte pushes the soft area, osteoporotic area of the insertion of the MCL and avulsion happens. So always very careful whenever in, uh, uh, in your surgical practice, whenever there is a resistance, stop it, recheck and then um, be careful, protect it and then proceed. So what happens once this avulsion happens, okay, what happens, what to do? The most common thing is uh, to get panic, whether to go for a constraint processes, what to do now. So most of the time, the avulsion injuries are very much easily treatable and no need a uh, constraint process. What is that option one? Option one is you can do this bond suturing or screw fixation. I will show you some examples. Karthik, whenever there is uh, time is up, you let me know. So, um, this 61-year-old female, stiff knee, you can see this osteoporotic stiff knee. Whenever you see a stiff knee, you have to be careful. And perioperatively, a small avulsion happens, particularly on the medial side. And this is how a screw augmentation has been done. And when you do a screw augmentation, you know that the MCL epicondyle is not actually injured so much. It is only the avulsion of the uh, fibers along with some bony piece on the medial side just below the epicondyle region. So majority of the fibers are intact. So you need not worry. You just need to augment with screws and you don't need to do any concern. You can protect the knee with the brace while walking. You can do active knee bending, no issues at all. So you, you can see this is a post-operative x-ray. One more case, osteoporotic, soft bone, again, screw like this. So the moment you see here, the avulsion happens particularly on the inferior portion, not on the epicondyle area, the inferior portion where you can see the medial side is tight. The moment after the trial, if you see this, you can, what you can do is take a small clamp, hook reduction clamp, clamp that small piece, whatever is available, and then fix it with two screws. Either it is better, you fix it with two screws, then do the cementation. You can do, a, you can use, I always do a PS knee. So that is more than enough for the uh, medial lateral constraint and you don't need any further uh, semi-constrained processes. So this is the post-operative x-ray. So you can see that screw fixation has been done. You can use washer. Most of the time, two screws is enough, but you have to, you cannot do multiple drills, one single drill, and then use a screw, cancel a screw with a washer. So severe varus, one more example, avulsion injury, again, augmented with screws. So we have, we have published an article in Journal of Arthroplasty particularly in uh, the uh, problem with avulsion injury. So in this article, what we have uh, described is a cup and saucer technique. So I have, what I found out is most of the time these problems happen when we are not able to dislocate the pretella in the tibia proximally. And this happens particularly when there is a cup and saucer. The bone loss is there, but posteriorly there is osteophyte. You cannot subluxate. So this is the most common indication if you try to forcibly bring it out the avulsion fracture avulsion injury happens so in this we have found out 68 percent of the knees have this morphology so you should not try to subluxate forcibly and this morphology chances of uh, avulsion injury is very high and all these cases in all our series we have fixed only with scan uh, screws and we have achieved good results so we have found out and concluded that it is not a catastrophic complication it can be managed successfully with screw and washer. 
no need of increased prosthetic constraint. And then comes, this is the avulsion which is more common. Then comes the mid substance stair, mostly hydrogenic due to saw blade injury. So when this happens, either it is a direct repair or reconstruction, when you're doing, trying to do some ad, uh, additional procedures or then sometimes you might need a majority of the times, if you are doing a direct repair, you may not need a con fully constrained implants, but if it is not feasible, then you might need a constrained processes. So hydrogenic, mostly hydrogenic, particularly due to saw blade. Another problem is there. When, when this happens, when you are trying to do a pie crusting, it may not show a direct, uh, immediate uh, opening, but pie crusting, you have to be very careful. I, in my practice, I don't do any pie crusting at all, but still a lot of studies and a lot of surgeons try to do that. But if you are doing a pie crusting, you have to be very careful. It is risky, but it because post-operatively, it can uh, give uh, an opening like that. It might open out post-operatively. See, this is a case done outside. It came with this had a history of pie crusting, see how it has opened out over the period of time. I don't know, within a short few months later, it has happened. So you have to be careful. So this is what was done, uh, hinged processes. So pie crusting, you have to be careful. So what happens when there is a direct uh, transaction? You need to augment that. The MCL augmentation has to be done. You can use a semi-tendinous graft, uh, tendon graft, or a quadriceps tendon. Most, most of the time, um, the semi-tendinous tendons are used. So whenever there is a uh, transaction, you have to do that. So this is how a um, semi-tendinous graft is harvested. Then you have to uh, fix it uh, superiorly on the medial side, medial femoral condyle with some screws and then augment it with the ethibon sutures. And then you have to, again, this is one more case of uh, fixation. Proximally, it has fixed with the bio screws. Distally also with sutures, it was fixed. And then this is a... Uh, one after reconstruction. This is complete transaction of an MCL. So whenever there is a complete transaction, a direct repair in the literature has failed. It has never healed. So it is better to augment it with some additional graft, particularly a semi-tendinous graft like that. And this is how a post-operative X-ray shows where a constraint process has been used. Whenever you use a constraint process, it is better to augment it with stem superiorly. This is a TC3 processes. In from Johnson and Johnson debut. So this, whenever you have a direct injury, this is better to augment it and use a constraint processes. So prevention, this is the most important thing. Whenever it happens, yes, you have to manage it, but how to prevent it? This is for the young surgeons. Always, whenever I open it, I always use these three homans. Two small, I have three small homans and one big. One big, I use it till I take a proximal TBL cut. Very important. So this is how this is how it has to be protected. If you see, always you use small homans like this and then you use a bigger homan like that. Why a bigger homan? A bigger homan and a bigger blade, it will prevent the blade to go further into the vascular area. So I always use a bigger blade and a bigger homan in the initial cut. And whenever you take the cut, always try to feel the petalar tendon in between so that you know where exactly the petalar tendon is. So once you've done that cut, you know that the cut is complete, then you can um, uh, be very sure that there is no injury. The next is while taking a distal femoral cut also, this can happen. How? See, if you can see the blade comes here and it is not protected. So what you have to do, you have to you take a Langenbach or a retractor and retract the soft tissue. Not only the MCL, even the soft tissue can be injured with this saw blade. So whenever you are doing a distal cut, make sure again, this small homan, this homan, medial and lateral, always it is there. The MCL is retracted properly and also this retractor for soft tissue. So make it this as a routine always so that you your team also knows, your sister knows how many instruments, what all the instruments you routinely use and this uh, osteotome to protect the proximal tibia. Again, what I, what I do is whenever I need to, this is for prevention of MCL injury, whenever you want to excise the meniscus, what I do is I try to pull the meniscus as much as possible. So it, it creates a tension, a taut effect. And when it does that, you just need to take the diathermy and touch it. You don't need to exercise with the blade. You just need to touch it and the MCL alone will get separated. So that way you will not injure the, uh, sorry, the meniscus alone will get separated. It will not, you will not injure the meniscus, uh, sorry, uh, MCL. So prevention is better. 
better rather than the management. So this is the MCL. Then comes the patellar tendon rupture. It is not very common. The patellar tendon mid-substance rupture is not very common. The avulsion injury is very common. Tibial tubercle avulsion happen, particularly in stiff knee osteoporotic. It is again patient related, surgery related. It's surgery related. We have to be very careful in uh, everting the patella. In this case, you should not try to evert it. Better to lateralize the patella with the homans. So avulsion of the tibial tubercle, it is an intraoperative complication that should be avoided rather than treated because it is not easy. Extensor mechanism, if it is injured, it is not easy. How to avoid? Best is to protect it. And if it's not possible to protect, change the technique. You have to change the technique in certain cases. Petalar tendon avulsion, these, whenever you see an osteoporotic uh, um, bone and uh, uh, rheumatoid conditions, if it is peeling off, put an anchor, put a staple like that and then proceed with the procedure. You can avoid complete avulsion. Then comes the, sim, uh, sim, sometimes if it is ruptured, you have to augment it with again um, uh, tendon graft. So you have to be very careful not to injure it or not to rupture, which is not a very, again, very, not very common. Simple repairs are not at all advisable. It doesn't give much results. So whatever the literature, it says direct repairs are never you have uh, sufficient, you have to augment it with some sort of graft. Augmentation by neighboring uh, semitendinous, gracilis, whatever you are familiar with. If not, you can call the um, uh, uh, specialist who is well versed with these kind of tendon harvesting and augmentation techniques. So again, this is a, a schematic representation. If there is a uh, mid-substance uh, tear or rupture, how to augment it. So uh, you, these are all the techniques how to uh, do that fixation. I will show you one example here. This is a petlar tendon rupture, rheumatoid patient. Actually, this patient came immediately after the TKR uh, with some small fall and because of that rupture happened. So this is how the rupture was diagnosed and then the graft was harvested. Use the ethibon sutures, prepare it and then pass it through the petella and then bring it down, enter it into the proximal tibia and then again, uh, re, uh, again you are um, augment it with some ethibon sutures. So by that way, you are able to do twice uh, to uh, augmentation and protect it with immobilizer. So when, when is the decision to make that you need to change the technique? See, this is a case where rheumatoid, stiff knee, cup and saucer, all potential problems for a avulsion of the petal tendon and the uh, MCL. So you have to be very careful. So this case, what is the problem? See this FFD, stiff knee, and non-ambulatory patient. So definitely bone is going to be soft. So in this case, I straight away um, went ahead, did the tibial tubercle osteotomy rather than doing any other uh, uh, manipulation procedure or trying to force it. So I prevented the uh, avulsion or the MCL in this way because of the osteotomy, I gained access into the joint without much difficulty. And then the DKR was done. And immediately after that, this uh, avulsion and uh, uh, osteotomy was fixed with an ethibond suture. And this is one year post-op. The patient is able to extend the knee completely. So all my tibial tubal clostotomies, I just fix with ethibond sutures, no other um, uh, metal wires. So tibial tubal osteotomy in a stiff knee due to post-traumatic or rheumatoid, excellent procedure. Suture fixation with 5-0 ethibond. So the take-home message here is, Try to prevent the avulsion of the petal tendon rather than managing it, which is not very easy. So vascular injury, again, it is not very common, but always we have to keep it in mind. It is not that uh, common. So where it happens, it is mainly the popliteal vessel, but the problem is it has to be identified. If it happens, it has to be identified. Otherwise, it, has, it becomes uh, life-threatening or it goes on, leads to an amputation. So late, uh, late identification is the most catastrophic. If at all it happens, you have to be very careful. It, it, sometimes it is indirect also. So thrombotic occlusion, that is not direct injury. That if it happens, if you have to, you have to uh, think or expect it when you see an x-ray like that. There's a calcified vessel. Whenever it is there, try to avoid the tunicase, particularly high pressures. I always try to avoid the tunicase in these kind of, because the plaques can get released, high chances of thrombus formation. So better to avoid the tunicate. Whenever this is the most important diagram. So whenever you see that the, actually the vessel, the uh, popliteal vessel, it is between 11 o'clock and 3 o'clock. It is not exactly in the middle. So it is between the 11 o'clock and 3 o'clock on the lateral side. 
so this is the medial side and this is the lateral side so you have to protect this area always so make sure your saw blade doesn't go very much on to the medial uh, middle and lateral area so you have to be very careful for the neurovascular so the distance between the popliteal artery and the tibia is greatest at 60 to 90 degrees of flexion in that move in that position you should not may put any homans or the saw blade has should not go so whenever you are taking a cut you have to be very careful between 60 and 90 degrees of flexion all your uh, homans has to be over the bone not very much deep so these are all the some risk factors for arterial injury and uh, patients whenever they have this come with all this hemorrhage aneurysm but these things are all only for theoretical but you have to be you have to doubt it and then pick it up at the early so management again endovascular methods i have just listed here but the, it is better to uh, call a vascular surgeon's help he will be a better person if you have uh, diagnosed it perioperatively so how to avoid as an orthopedic surgeon how i try to avoid is whenever i want to do any posterior release what i do is i bend the tip of the diathermy once i bend it i with my one of my fingers i try to push the neurovascular bundle posteriorly in that way i know exactly where i am dealing with so with this bent tip i always go posterior on the board and i am without any much of uh, doubt i go ahead and do the release because the neurovascular bundle is prevented and pushed with my finger the middle finger or whichever way you are so you can see that here again i am you pushing it here also i am pushing it with my index finger and then above the finger and away from that uh, neurovascular structure i very i confidently i can do the release without much problem so this is the way i try to prevent so the vascular injuries again the best way is to prevent it the last section is the perioperative fracture it's it may not be that common but you have to be very careful identify it and augment it so how to identify again look at this x ray stiff knee and suddenly after after the trial you can see after the tibial tray cementation was done when forcibly flexing this medial condyle opened out why this opened out later on it was found out why it was done. but once it happens you should not panic you have to make sure that this is addressed what was done it was clamped it was reduced and then fixed with screws and washers and then immediately augmented with a uh, uh, stem extension because there is a weak condyle which has been augmented you have to bypass it get a uh, additional zone of fixation with the stem and this was done and patient is doing well why that chances are there i'll come to that point again one more case perioperative fracture augmented uh, with a screw fixation this one is only a small uh, hairline crack which was only screw fixation so prevention of perioperative fractures how to prevent it the most important thing is the sizing is important why this happens whenever there is a notch particularly if you are doing a posterior referencing you have to be very careful but whenever before doing the sizing you have to remove all the soft tissue anteriorly take off all the uh, synovial tissue make sure your bone is exposed then you do the proper sizing check for the notching don't hesitate to check once again twice protect your with the homers the moment you do that you can take the anterior cut you, you make sure that you don't have uh, soft tissues covering because you may not know the moment if it is a notching is expected or seeing that stop it for that you need all this retractors to make sure the visibility is proper after the cut you can see this piano sign great piano sign and the posterior cuts again when you are doing that make sure your homans are protecting the medial collateral and the lateral collateral and then once you start doing the posterior cuts i always try to hit the bone so that the moment the cut is taken it will give way so that means you have to stop then the chamfer cuts again the protection has to happen and then do it very carefully and once you do that i use curved osteotome posteriorly gently tap it why this is where the fracture can happen particularly after taking the notch cut ah, here comes see the notch cut is the most important thing to prevent the perioperative fracture when you do the notch cut you cannot turn the blade the saw blade here and there the notch cut should not go very deep the moment it goes deep then it weakens the condyle so that is very important the second important point is second important point is see the screw and uh, the pin here the pin has been placed here and when you 
remove the pin and that pin hole and this notch cut cut matches that weakens the condyle so you can see here if the pin is also in this area and if your notch cut blade goes and hits that uh, pin slot then the fracture can happen if the it weakens the condyle that is where the lateral condyle can fracture so you have to be very careful that uh, your notch cut blade has to be straight and not deep and again you can see how i excise the meniscus pull the meniscus very nicely taut make it taut and use a diethermy just touch it and again posterior cuts posterior osteophytes when you are removing that time you have to be very careful that you remove only chip the condyle just to posterior to the condyle you cannot very harshly do that because it will crack the condyle so the most important point here is the moment if there is a crack happens you have to be identify it and augment it with the uh, uh, stem augmentation see again one more uh, case example you can see lytic lesions these kind of cystic lesions uh, in the condyles is very common either it will be in the medial side or in the lateral side in a valgus knee it will be on the lateral side moment you identify if it is very huge curate it nicely and already you have taken if you have taken a uh, notch cut and then in this big this is there curate it nicely augment it with bone graft and after that you see if the uh, defect is too big better to augment with the uh, stem like that so this is the most important thing that you try to identify the problem and get additional fixation with these kind of small stems even a small cemented stem will help you so the whole point about this pitfalls and complications is that identification perioperatively you have to identify if it happens don't get panic just try to find out how you can uh, manage it and then try to use uh, manage it augment it with a tendon or a stem if it needs otherwise if it is only an avulsion injury most of the time you don't need any constraint processes thank you so treatment without prevention is simply unsustainable thanks for your patient listening fantastic fantastic talk sir uh, thank you very much um, you covered uh, the most important uh, problems uh, and selected the three most important problems and we just covered them very well and i'm sure uh, they all got a clear picture uh, we will quickly discuss a uh, couple of cases yep um, so i invite uh, dr arun kan and dr bharat uh, um, rajkumar sir everyone to contribute as we go through i invite dr kaushik uh, to actually present the case um, then uh, after that uh, arun also has a case to present so uh, we can go through that so kaushik These are a few case scenarios uh, which we recently uh, um, had. Yes, Kaushik, go ahead. So. Um... So this is the first case. The 68-year-old female, the morbidly obese patient with a pneumonia of a This is the clinical picture of the patient. The left knee was operated uh, one year back, and the right knee shows a severe virus deformity. This is the walking video of the patient. She is only only with one. This is an important picture showing the last part of the body. This is a pre-op 
So this is a case we just wanted to have for discussion. Um, we, we've got an obese lady. She's unable to walk. Um, she's got severe virus on both knees. Of course, we did the we did one knee already. Uh, this is the other knee. Um, so uh, there are a few issues in uh, this patient. One is the obesity, the morbid obesity, and the obesity is concentrated around the knee, and uh, and uh, she's got uh, a medial side bone loss. And uh, she's got a um, increased tibial slope on the on the lateral X-ray. We can see the uh, slope. And uh, as Dr. Rajkumar was pointing out, she was going towards that uh, cup and saucer sort of a deformity here in her uh, in her X-ray. So um, how uh, how will you go about this case? Uh, um, we can uh, start with uh, in, in planning and prevention of any problems. What uh, what will you have in your armamentarium, and uh, will it be a routine case for you, or will uh, how will you go about this case, and what are the problems you expect in positioning, in exposure, and in releases, and uh, in, in terms of constraint? Um, these are the questions uh, we have in mind as a novice surgeon starting to operate, and this being uh, you know one of your one of your first few cases. What will you? Do? So um, shall I start with uh, Dr. Bharat? Yeah. Yes, yes, please. Bharat. Yeah, Karthi, as you said, this is a, a morbid obese uh, patients under morbid obese category. So the first uh, concern with the exposure, we are going to approach this case with the middle parapetella as a routine case. But uh, the exposure might be bigger. The incision could be bigger. The problem is going to be you are not able to, not even going to avert your petella. So you are going to push your petellas on the lateral side. So petella tendon avulsion means the tendon avulsing from the tibial tuberosity could be a problem. So as a precautious measure, you can go for a petal tendon pins to prevent that avulsion. That is one precaution that you can take. And of course, um, because of the, uh, and, and the medial side, you're going to release your superficial MCL. So that is also going to be a challenge. So the, the problem is, since the posterior slope is going to, is more uh, in deep flexion. So the deep flexion is going to be a problem because you're going to operate under a tonique and a big thigh. So more the flexion, the, the deep flexion is also going to be a problem. So uh, the, the point is, sometimes in these kind of cases, you have to do the femur first. So, so this is a case where uh, that can typically handle by doing your femur cut first, including all your distal femur, the rotations, everything can be fixed and do a femur first in this particular case because of the excessive posterior slope. The point is, the excessive, this is not a cup and saucer kind of a deformity, but still, and deflection in these cases, you can easily subluxate your, uh, your tibia. But what happens because of your bigger size thighs, the, the gravity is going to push your thigh entirely down the bottom. So uh, uh, at, at 60 to 90 degree, as said, the higher chance of vascular injuries. So putting your homens back inside, it, it, the most of the time, this uh, knee is going to have friction between 30 to 60 degrees. You're putting your uh, homens in that 60 to 70 degrees to, to pop your tibia forward. You are going to have a, a damage on your on your uh, on, on your vascular injury chances are more. So uh, I would personally, in such kind of cases, I would go for the the femur first. So going for a fixed three degrees rotation, maybe later I'll go for a more release on the medial side. And coming to managing the tibia defect, or uh, if at all the tibia defect is uh, less than ten mm, I would manage with the uh, with with the bone grafting screws. And definitely considering the the morbid obese group. You are always going to have a mind that that you are going to go for a short cemented stem. So uh, if, if the defect is less than five mm or a five to seven mm, you can go with fill with the cement and go for a complete cemented short cemented stem. So if at all the defect is major or bigger than ten mm, so you go for a bone graft and go for a longer stem. I think beyond that, I don't think so. Any other uh, challenging task and. Uh, Averting the petala, if, if you are going to do a, a petala re resurfacing, then uh, averting the petala is going to be a problem. And uh, you have to replace your petala in, in, uh, in, in your extended positions. You cannot, it's not possible to avert your petala completion. Fantastic. I think you summed up everything very nicely. Uh, sir, Rajkumar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the good Bharat, Bharat uh, uh, almost has yes, uh, uh, very clearly... Uh, explain a uh, couple of things i would like to add here is one is the, the moment uh, for youngsters the moment you see an x-ray like that couple of things is very obvious that in the ap view you can see there is a bone loss on the medial side very obvious lateral side the knee is sublux the subluxation is happening because of the bone loss so these kind of bone loss subluxation what i will suggest is 
try to take a uh, stress view so whether whether the knee is stiff or not make it as a routine because 60% of the time you will see the how much of opening is happening so you will not need much of release at all because the subluxation is happening due to the bone loss and not due to the contracture so first thing is try to take a stress view many a times it may not help but lot of times it will help first point second point is see this she uh, she is very obese and you see the medial side okay the medial femoral condyle the epicondylar region you can see the classic osteoporotic soft beaking osteophytes this is the most potential case for a chance of an avulsion so th the moment you see this you have to excise that medial osteophyte which is very bulky before even proceeding further so the moment as i told in my talk i always put a homans protect it and chip it off the moment you chip it that will not get impinged when you are doing a trial so that is where the trial when you are trying to do that trial insert will impinge this osteophyte and push the uh, mcl avulsion happens so you remove that and in fact you will not need any superficial mcl release at all in this case many a times 90% of the time you don't need to do any superficial mcl at all so the thing is do this all this basic steps remove this medial osteophyte try to achieve a reduction osteotomy and then you might get away with all those uh, extensive release that is the point number 1 point number the next important thing is coming to the lateral it is really very unusual for having this kind of a slope which is which is not very common so you have to keep that in mind when you are doing and also if you see the proximal tibia is bent posteriorly in this plane that is also very very you have to be careful when you are placing your tray so in this case you have to you cannot place the tray try to prepare the tray in keeping it in center you have to anteriorize the you have to bring the tray little anterior so your entry point has to be very careful in fact you don't hesitate to use a cm in this case even when you are putting a stem do keep a cm ready so it's a very unusual uh, deformed tibia proximal tibia so the see the shape and in fact i'm happy that they have taken a very good lateral view true lateral which shows the entire deformity so keep a cm make sure you don't uh, take the tray anterior as you do it in your routine case don't keep any slope because there is already excessive slope even if this case don't get much of flexion post ovulate don't worry too much but you have to you cannot keep too much of slope in this the more the slope you keep then it is very difficult to balance this knee then the, keep that in mind and then the another important point which i would like to tell is try to keep the cuts minimal when you are beginning with in this case start with the minimal cut whenever you need more cut you can revisit and cut it but keep it minimal in that way you can balance it and as bharat said definitely keep your uh, uh, short uh, cemented stem because of obesity and bone loss on table you decide and also one more in this case what if you are using a short cemented stem or no stem at all you lateralize the tibial tray in that way you can do a reduction osteotomy and get away with a uh, lot of release one other uh, one uh, excellent sir one other point is uh, these uh, obese ladies who been walking with a big, big varus thrust for a long time hmm. they have a lot of uh, lcl laxity definitely yes, there is somebody in this case that, in this case not much of uh, laxity it is mainly the uh, subluxation which is causing but yes. i accept yes obese ladies lack any in, the in, balancing is important see in severe uh, in severe varus cases um after uh, so, after uh, all the medial release and sometimes even the medial epicondyle you find that uh, there is some residual lateral laxity i mean have you seen that and yeah, yeah. you address it actually do you go and tighten the lateral side or do you just keep on increasing the insert size to make sure or you go for a the increased constraint how do you uh, right. decide on that kartik that is why that is why one simple solution for that is to keep your in these kind of severe cases you are if you balance it properly and try to avoid too big a cut your insert size will be 8 only or maximum 10 so that means your balancing is okay the moment your balancing needs more bigger insert that means you have taken a lot of bone the moment you take lot of bone 
then it is difficult already there is laxity and there is a too big a uh, cut has been taken then how to balance it then post operatively it will stretch out and if you see post operative x ray suddenly the patient lateral side will be opening out so first foremost after it happens it is very difficult to manage how can you go and tighten it on the lateral side i don't think that will all uh, help you in big way and also all your bracing I is totally only for your mental totally. satisfaction so i will suggest here is first is to uh, brace uh, sorry uh, make it very very minimal cut then you end up with the minimal poly your balancing will be okay Ar arun anything to add yeah um, so uh, sir uh, if there is some lateral laxity would you i mean sometimes you, would you go for a semi constraint insert in such cases or uh, just uh, not uh, do any of that just accept the lateral laxity little bit of See, lateral laxity little See, bit like, is there, i think we can accept if it is more than mm. semi i'll tell you one uh, one thing uh, it is all our gut feeling and experience See the two mm or three mm. How can you measure perioperatively? It is not possible. But if it is grossly open, so a PS knee itself will take care most of the time in that kind of a laxity. So the the judge the judgment should be there should be a stop. The laxity there should be a stop. The two mm it's little bit opening, but it stops. Like your ACL, you try to uh, examine your ACL. Okay, oh. like that you stop. It with the stop, then st that you can accept. But if it is opening again, then you need to con more use a constraint. Yeah. So I mean, I think in these cases, I think it's more important to restore the alignment uh, properly. If you leave it a little bit lax uh, laterally and leave it in various alignment, then it will uh, sort of open out more uh, post-operatively over time. Definitely. And uh, one more thing, Karthik. Uh, so you are also a fairly regular CR surgeon. I think this is uh, not a great case for CR, though, given the amount of slope that this person has. Let me show you what we did. Yeah, I, I know. I was expecting this answer. Uh, I was about to tell Arun that uh, CR surgeons like to challenge and then do these no, kind no. of cases. Good, good. It's actually an ideal case, I will say. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, Kaushik, just move ahead and show the. So, the standards which we faced were uh, morbid obesity, which causes the half to thigh infringement. Hyperextension deformity, the medial tibia bone loss, and increased post operative So, this is the post operative. Sorry for the bad lateral view. This patient is uh, it's only recently done. So, uh, so I did exactly what uh, was suggested uh, uh, by all of you actually. But uh, just forgive me, actually, I put a CR knee, but I put a dish insert there. Uh, it, the only reason I put a CR knee was. Uh, I'm uh, so worried about uh, taking a big chunk of bone from the, the center part of the um, femur and then exposing the both the condyles for uh, any chance of fracture, especially in such an obese lady, very thin bones. So um, I'm just, uh, after, actually we had to resect the PCL for balancing and after putting the deep dish, actually the anthroposterior stability was so good. Even with the normal CR insert, it, there was no anthroposterior laxity. So so I, I just went ahead and did a CR knee there. Um, so uh, I think that's it. Any, any, anything to add here? I mean, the, you can show the others. Do you have the other side's X-ray? The other side X-ray is similar. It was done about two months back. And it's, uh, it's very similar as well. So this was the shortest tibial, uh, cemented tibial stem we had. So we went for that. And uh, the rest of the defect, we just put cement there. Now that the calf thigh impingement is what uh, Dr. Bharat was mentioning and you were mentioning. So in that case, I think as you suggest, we do the femur, finish the femur and then come to the TBS. That's what you suggest, right? Yeah. Okay. I think uh, next case, uh, Kaushik. Kaushik? Anything to add? Other any questions you... from other uh, participants? So, Karthik, uh, in this case, did you plan a, a deep dish uh, initially and uh, sort of adjust the slope for uh, PCL resection or uh, did you decide? Yeah, in... No, I go for deep dish most of the time. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I go for... Karthik, I, can I add one more point here? For... Karthik? Uh, tell me, sir. One more, just a point for young surgeon. See, uh, a CR knee, if the surgeon is uh, very confident, it's an excellent... Uh, technique it is better uh, nice to do it is a it, good results are uh, 
in the literature that is all okay but a young surgeon uh, in a center like in Coimbatore or in Chennai uh, people might have the, all this uh, deep dish kind of inserts that is good but in the periphery if they are uh, trying to do a you know, CR knee and if they this don't have a deep dish they should not compromise on that so yeah. What I will suggest is if the need comes for a PCL release, if you are not able to balance it without doing any PCL release and then you are putting a CR is good, but if you are not having a deep dish, better to come discuss with this company people. And if your need comes of PCL, I will suggest to go for a PL. Uh, yes. PS. Okay. No, I totally agree with it. It was just my apprehension about uh, losing a lot of bone and then exposing it to a fracture in that uh, situation. That's what uh, we did. Good, good. Kaushik, run through the other cases quickly so that we can. Kaushik, I think you are muted. See, this is an interesting case. Uh, it's an auto, auto rickshaw driver who's been walking with a severe valgus deformity for the past four years and uh, FFD. He's got a FFD with a valgus deformity. Um, Kaushik, are you back? Sir. Yeah. So this is the gate of the patient. He's mobilizing only with elbow crutch. And he has this uh, sort of a morphonoid future. He's very tall. Um, <clears throat> And inflammatory arthritis sort of picture. Go ahead, show the X-ray. This is the X-ray. I wanted to show this case uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is he had a, almost 20-25 uh, degrees of FFD and uh, I was sure that it was all coming from the soft tissue because there were no osteophytes. Probably his muscles were too tight and I thought after uh, anesthesia, he, all that will relax and he will just stretch out. But uh, uh, under anesthesia, nothing stretched out. He still had that FFD. It's probably all his hamstrings were too tight. He's been walking like that for a long time with a bent knee. The problem he faced intraoperatively in this patient, since all this intraop pitfall, I want to discuss this. We had a huge flexion extension gap mismatch. Now, his flexion just opened up and his extension wouldn't, this extension gap was zipped after taking the normal cut. And we've been cutting, recutting as much as we can until, a, until the, but his uh, extension gap was uh, not matching the flexion gap. In the sense, what I mean is I was still with the FFD. So this was the situation. Have you ever faced such a situation and uh, what would you do in that uh, case? Rajkumar, sir. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> looking at, see, uh, the I don't know about the blood parameters here. Looking at the X-ray, if you don't tell any history or any blood parameters uh, given to me, if I if I am shown this x-ray, I will say this is an inflammatory arthritis. Yeah, it is inflammatory. Oh, it is inflammatory? Okay. Uh, so, but yes. even, so he, was, he, was he treated for that? It was Or it was neglected? It was neglected but treated. Treated for almost one and a half two years. After that, he just left it. Any native <laughs> treatment was done? Uh, sir, he, Why I am asking is, uh, see, uh, this is an inflammatory arthritis there can have a two uh, conditions. One is not all cases are fully correctable after anesthesia. Okay. So some cases have this kind of residual and these are the cases where they had underwent some native treatment, uh, massage, oil bandage, all those kind of things. All this, these are the cases post-operatively goes in for this orthrofibrosis kind of, uh, kind of uh, situations. So this, this is the case we have to be a little very careful in the balancing and also one important thing I will suggest, I will say is I will not try to take too much of bone from the femur. So in this is the case where you have try to get this balancing but by taking too much of bone from the femur and then have an instability. So that is becomes a, white, a very bad nightmare to balance it and he will end up 
in a unhappy situation and his FFD will never correct. So two things on table. If you find this situation, two things you can do. What is that? First thing is try to release the hamstring. Okay. Do an hamstring release subsequently. You can do the TKR and then try to do it or before painting itself, take a knife, do the hamstring release and then go ahead and do the uh, procedure. And what you should do is not able, don't take too much of bone from the distal femur, keep it minimal, do the cuts, do extensive release posteriorly, capsular release and five degrees of uh, residual uh, FFD, you can leave it. But if it's still, as you faced that if it is more, what I will do is I will put a POP. What I will do is try to stretch it, like put a POP in uh, 10 de 15 degrees of flexion, put a POP, first make a window for the wound and then after a week later, remove that POP, give some uh, CPM, stretch nicely, try to stretch, reapply the cast. That is kind of a serial casting. I have yeah. done in a couple of cases and I have achieved almost zero degrees of extension. Okay. This is not very common, rare, but in an inflammatory condition, 5 degrees of FFT, you can leave it, slowly stretch it. But if it is very severe in this case, that is one. Second thing is, in spite of all these things, if you think the mismatch is too much, then no other go, you have to straight away go for a hinge. You have to do a complete release and go for a hinge. But it is very, very uncommon. Very, very uncommon. Bharat, sir? Yeah. Uh, Karthik, um, one is, is inflammatory arthritis. So whenever you have a deformity, your aim is not to correct to zero in a case of such inflammatory arthritis. What has been said is up to 30% you can leave it off. Suppose suppose you have 20 degrees, as said by Dr. Rajkumar, you can leave 5 degrees, you can leave it bind, blindly, a normal brace can, and, and if you strengthen your cord reserves in a, in, a, in, a, in a matter of 10 to 15 days, it will stretch out completely because you are going to eliminate the disease process. Okay, so the one is aim is not to correct fully, if at all, if at all, even suppose this is a male patient, you can aim for zero degree also. Suppose in a female patient, lacks rheumatoid active uh, rheumatic uh, rheumatoid disease, if you correct it to zeros, if you see a post-op, it goes into five degrees of hyperextension. That is also not a good for such kind of situation. So for a rheumatoid, if you leave a little tight, one to two degrees of a tighter knee, they stretch well and they do very well. One point. The, the other point is you aim, you are going to have a flexion extension mismatch in such kind of cases. So you make your cuts properly. You're going to have, so um, CR is not a good option in this particular cases. So you are not going to have a TBL slope. Your TBL slope is going to aim for zero to three degrees, maximum three, not more than that. So that is going to close your flexion gap. So one thing is going to happen. And while sizing, while sizing, it's always better to go upsize your femur. Suppose you have between a size between three or four, you go for a, a four size femur so that your flexion gap is closed. So I said more than distal femur resection should be limited, but maximum up to plus two or plus four mm is allowed to, you, you are allowed to take to such an extent. And uh, for this particular kind of a lateral view and 20 degrees of F, I don't think so, such a kind of hamstring release are required. Only you just put your knee in extensions, go for a complete uh, like Rana with technique. You just go from medial to lateral or the tibial cortex, your release of your capsule and your lateral structures. I think uh, this, this patient could be solved. One to five degrees residual FFD will correct over a period of time. Anything more to add? Yeah, I think, uh, see, looking at the x-ray, uh, the posterior condylar offset seems to be really low even on the native x-ray. So I think you can expect uh, some kind of flexion laxity uh, in such kind of knees. So I think uh, that is something that we can see here and I think others, uh, they have already covered. So we can leave it in the, this. I mean, uh, the pre-op x-ray looks like about 15, 20 degree FFD. So even if you get about 10 degree FFD at the end of the procedure, I think we can accept uh, and... Uh, and uh, expected to correct over time. As Rajkumar sir said, we also had a uh, couple of cases where we left it in flexion uh, and then serially casted it over time. Th those two were patients who had become uh, sort of had flexion deformity uh, at the developing age, juvenile arthritis. So those were not correctable intraops. So we just uh, accepted about 20 degree, 25 degree flexion deformity, then serially casted, uh, which casted and corrected over a period of three weeks. Excellent, excellent. No, I, I, uh, I like always inflammatory arthritis, it will correct by itself. It is not actually the true thing. 
there particularly cases rheumatoid ffd is there like 25 degrees ffd many a times you will face post operatively 15 degrees of 10 degrees of ffd is always there those patients are very unhappy so you have to be very careful and uh, take a decision like a soft supple knee it will get corrected stretched out what was done yeah go ahead uh, you show the previous experience so pre previous slide i think you were going to show the previous so that's the standing view you can see that uh, okay and then next one so you can see as yes, uh, dr bharat suggested we have actually oversized the femur there a little bit to match for that posterior offset and uh, we did a straight forward knee and we left him in about 10 degree 10 degree of ffd uh, i accepted that ffd i just left him there uh, and uh, and that's about 3 months or four, i think it's about 4 5 months since we did the surgery and today we just called him to send his uh, walking video is already riding his auto and all that and that's his uh, that fellow has no ffd whatsoever is perfectly all right and he is uh, he's actually sent a running video actually he's running around so uh, all your points are well taken the ffd got corrected completely in fact in the post operative period itself uh, um, slowly within about 3 days the ffd slowly uh, reduced and uh, when the first follow up we started giving exercises squat sub stimulation and stretches and he got completely corrected he is a very happy man now and he's been suffering for a long time kaushik we got one more case yes sir quickly quickly we'll go through that and then we'll go to our next case so this is a 68 year old female with a bilateral way knee varus deformity and the varus was passively corrected uh, this is a full length standing view of the patient go ahead go ahead so this patient uh, we had a uh, hydrogenic mcl substance here yeah, so which so, was prepared using a suture and cut no the what see this this uh, this was this case was uh, bilateral bilateral simultaneous tkr so the first side was done everything was over and the second side uh, she was obviously obese and it was tight and uh, we, we were releasing and uh, um, i was taking an additional tbl cut after taking the tbl cut i just was running my saw uh, medially Uh, on the tibia because there was a little bit of skiving from the previous cut and i i i just believe that probably that socket went and cut the mcl so the mcl was transected mid section iatrogenically by me so uh, this was an iatrogenic mid substance mcl rupture cost <laughs> cost one side was complete this was the second side so uh, no uh, uh, since uh, this case the the, the In, in the lecture it was discussed we thought we we'll just add it and uh, what we did was we did a uh, suture anchor repair and also we added a double row repair in the sense of augmented it with fiber tapes and fiber wires and added a lateral row anchor just like how we do a rotator cuff repair since we do uh, uh, tendon work so we were uh, work will was do you have a video of that or kaushik yes just take x-ray is it so the knee was implanted it was found out during uh, the trial time itself that it, the medial it, uh, was ruptured so the knee was implanted and then after that the repair was done uh, because i didn't want to uh, um, do the repair with the trial on and then i want i didn't want to disturb the repair again so and then uh, so we took uh, we added suture anchors and then we added a lateral row anchor as well that was the post op x-ray and this patient is about 4 months you can show that uh, walking video she was braced for 6 weeks and uh, she is just refusing to come to the hospital she is she is doing very well i was actually very uh, anxious as to what is happening with her and uh, kept on calling her to find out how she is and all that but uh, she has done really well after 6 weeks uh, the brace was removed and uh, the mcl has healed well and she is very stable water any comments or anything 
I was, think CR knees uh, repair is known to do well. If you've done a PS knee, uh, I think generally an augmentation uh, plus or minus constraint implants is uh, is the way forward. But in CR knees, uh, I mean uh, repair. Uh, repairs can work. So that is also because uh, PCL acts as a secondary stabilizer on the medial side. So if you have retained the PCL, then this is an option uh, that is feasible. Yeah, I, I was about to mention that. Uh, uh, good thing Arun has uh, talked about it. So PCL is additional stability. That way you are okay. But uh, if you are uh, even any doubt with the PCL, I will suggest for a, a semi constraint like a TC yeah. insert. Okay. But yeah. we were ready to take the semi T and do a complete augmentation of the MCL. But after the repair, it was quite stable. So uh, it was so we we all we have the entire MCL sutured with fiber wire and it was also anchored back to the tibia. So it's like a double row. So it probably worked and it healed well. And probably it was not a complete injury, it was probably about 75%, maybe some. Posterior fibers were still intact, uh, but uh, on the safer side, we did a repair and it uh, fortunately turned out very good. Thank you very much. Uh, Arun, are you going to show your case? Yeah. So, it'll be a very short one. Are you able to see it? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this was a 68 year old lady, painful, I mean, bilateral knees, painful, left was what she was concerned about more. She was a very short lady, four feet, 10 inches, BMI 30. These were the x rays, fairly simple looking. <clears throat> Everything was going uh, fairly smoothly, and then um, at the time of uh, broaching for the tibial seal, there was resistance. I was not able to fully uh, sort of broach in the tibia. So okay. uh, I took a step back uh, to see what was happening. And then um, are you able to see the keel is actually, I mean, the tibia is fairly well posteriorized, the tibial plate, it is not anterior, but still the keel is coming. Uh, well, very close to the anterior compact, it is not going in after that. Okay. This was the situation that we had uh, intra-op. So, maybe, uh, what would you do at this point? Yeah, we take a couple of opinions. Yeah, Karthik? Uh, Arun, sorry, I just, uh, I just missed you for a sec. Yeah, yeah, so I was just saying, well, I mean, everything was done, femoral cuts were done, everything, trials had been done, and then the tibial keel was put. While well, trying to broach for the tibial keel, uh, the keel was going and hitting against the anterior complex, and it was not going. To... And this was the smallest tibia, one size, one tibia of uh, the genesis that was what we were using. It's a very interesting, uh, peculiar situation. Can show the pre-op. Rajkumar sir. Yeah, yeah. Like I wanted to see the Arun, pre -up. Arun, did you do it manually or with a robot? No, no, this was manual. Okay. Uh, you, you could appreciate that the slope is more on the on the side. Yeah, I mean, this is yes, actually the slope is okay, but if you see that uh, uh, proximal tibial anterior side, that is like a the shape is. Uh, no, sir. I'm saying it on the on, on the CM picture. Ah, CM. The CM picture, which shows slope is a little little more than. Uh, I mean, it's it's okay, but it's a it's little it's slightly on the higher side, isn't it, Arun? Yeah. So we are purposely kept like that, or yeah, the native slope measured about twelve degrees. I sort of uh, sort of planned for about eight to ten degrees. I mean, the, for CR knee, we try to reproduce the slope, keep it as close to seven as possible. Maybe I uh, tried for seven and uh, went a little bit beyond. Um, yeah, so basically uh, that is what uh, identified intra up, uh, and it, I mean, I think we would have gotten away with uh, most other systems and most other patients with this kind of slope. 
but this was a really short lady size one tibia didn't go in uh, so that is what uh, we found out so once we i mean i found that out uh, so yeah we what we did was adjusted adjusted the slope and uh, pinned the tibial tray next uh, so that's what was done how did you identify that uh, the, the trial was not going in is it yeah i mean not the trial but the trial in mean, the broach, uh, broach for broach the preparation for the for the uh, keel was not going in uh, arun which implant was that tibial ray is, is genesis or genesis 2 genesis 2 that genesis. Uh, probably has the longest keel uh, of yeah. all the systems that we have Sometimes uh, while doing PFC, we do face such kind of problems for a shorter, small size. What we used to do is we used to remove the, the, the plastic button, which is down there. And then yeah. we, we did implant it. That will avoid the impingement on the anterior cortex. Yeah, I have, uh, I have heard about that. I've never faced that uh, problem. We have done a lot, many number of times with smaller size tibia. Um, we used to remove the poly, which is screwed up into the tip of the keel. We will just remove, you will just get around 5 mm of extra distance clearance so that that can be... The, the problem with this tray, this it's not a problem. Actually, this is an anatomical tray, it's asymmetrical tray. The tray in PFC is a symmetrical one. So you can rotate here and there and then uh, somehow they put it in. Here, this is a asymmetrical. So you cannot rotate it too much also. So you have to be a little careful. But uh, so what did you do? Yeah, yeah. So we, I mean, reduced the slope, uh, took out a little bit more bone anteriorly, and uh, this was the refixed tray. So now you can see that uh, once uh, the tibial, I mean, you can see the uh, tibial uh, mm. preparation, it is sort of going almost into the canal. But uh, since it was uh, gone this way, I decided to add a stem also just to give some additional support. So we put in a short cemented stem uh, for this. And this was the post-op X-ray. And uh, I think, uh, I mean, the uh, native slope, uh, I had it measured post, uh, uh, I mean, uh, here. So it was about uh, 12 degrees of slope. Uh, I mean, 12 degrees of slope is not very uncommon in our population. We see, uh, I think, a lot of studies from Ganga also on tibial slope. So 12 degree slope is not uncommon, especially in our population. But uh, this was a very short statured patient. And the long keel of Genesis also, I think, was one of the problems. Uh, it has probably the longest keel of all the systems that we have. The second option that I was sort of preparing in case uh, we had a problem even after correcting the okay. stroke was I was getting a backup of another system arranged uh, like a triathlon going easily on this. Otherwise, you have to cut the tip of this keel. Yeah, I mean, that is one way. Yeah. It's not possible. It's not easy. Yeah, I mean, we, do, we need to have instruments to do that. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's not yeah. Easy. So the, the point, the key point here is identification of the problem. So you have a good thing that you didn't bang it. And yeah. That, yeah, that, yeah. That to putting the cement inside, trying to bang and all sorts of problems happening. So good thing that you checked under the CM. So that is the most important prevention. So that way you are able to identify the problem. So that was good. Yeah. It's always, always better to find the intra rather than the post op exit. Good. Excellent case, Arun. Thanks for that. Uh, any questions from uh, other participants? Actually, there are a lot more participants on uh, uh, live on, on the YouTube and uh, the Ortho TV channel. Uh, uh, and we've um, have actually sent the invite to COS and uh, Tripu district members to join on this uh, uh, group as well. So anyone has any pressing question? Um, This is the right time to ask. Okay. If there are no more questions, then uh, I think we've had a wonderful session today. Uh, Dr. Rajkumar actually covered uh, very nicely and precisely, practically all the points about uh, intraoperative complications, especially the MCL rupture, the patellar tendon injury and the vascular injury and the periprosthetic fractures, intraoperative fractures. And... Uh, and uh, tips to avoid uh, avoid them and how to deal with them if, uh, God forbid, uh, one come, comes across such a problem. Uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, Rajkumar, sir, for uh, participating. And uh, I thank uh, Dr. Bharat and uh, Arun also uh, for participating in the discussion. I thank Kaushik for uh, presenting all the cases.
um, and uh, I thank all the um, viewers who have been watching uh, with us. Um, and uh, thank you very much. So with that, we'll uh, close this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karthik. Good uh, initiative Thanks, and sir. good program. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Karthik. Thanks, sir. Thank you.